Um, I really have uh, no role to play in this morning's panel, but I, I am very, very delighted to actually introduce the chair um, of said panel, uh, Jack Mengtat Chia. Um, and I can't say enough about Jack. Uh, he came uh, to the Center for Buddhist Studies as a postdoctoral fellow, and he's just been an amazing addition uh, to the community, um, and I hope uh, that his second year uh, of his uh, fellowship uh, will ju be just as fruitful as the first. Um, I, when uh, Derek, um, we got together for a, for a pre-conference drink uh, at the hotel, Derek said to me, well, uh, you know, in Singapore they're asking when Jack is going to be back. <laughs> Because this, apparently he left a, a great void in Singapore. Uh, so we're very happy to say not just yet, not just yet. We have another year. So let me give you a little bit of a background. Um, Jack is a National University of Singapore Overseas Postdoctoral Fellow uh, at the Center for Buddhist Studies at UC Berkeley. He's a historian. He's interested in religion. Um, and in particular, Buddhism and Chinese popular religion. Um, in terms of a regional focus, he's particularly interested in maritime Southeast Asia. And uh, he works on the trans-regional circulation of people, ideas, and resources. Um, he holds a BA, uh, an MA from the National University in Singapore, and a second MA from Harvard University. Uh, where he was a Harvard Yenching scholar. And his PhD is from Cornell University. Um, he's currently working on a book manuscript, tentatively titled, still tentatively titled? <laughs> still tentatively titled, uh, Diaspora's Dharma, Buddhism and Modernity Across the South China Sea. So please help me welcome the chair of today's panel, Jack Chia. Thanks, Andrew, for the really kind and very generous introduction. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on a Saturday morning. Today is the second and final day of the Across the High Seas Conference. I must confess that I'm not a morning person, but I'm truly happy and honored to moderate this morning's panel. The first speaker for this panel is Dr. Jun Kimura. Dr. Kimura is an associate professor at the Department of Maritime Civilization, Tokai University. His research focuses on underwater maritime and nautical archaeology. He has conducted research at numerous underwater sites, including the Maritime Siru site, submerged sites in Japan, and naval battlefield sites related to the 13th century Kublai Khan invasion of Japan and Vietnam. Dr. Kimura is the author of a recent book, Archaeology of East Asian Shipbuilding. His presentation this morning is titled, Voyage and Shipbuilding During the Maritime Syria Period. Dr. Kimura. All right. Um, first, I would like to thank the um, Institute of East Asian Studies and um, Town Center for Silk Road Studies for this such a wonderful opportunities um, for me to join and uh, um, this important uh, opportunities to address um, maritime Silk Road um, topics with um, um, my old friends and new friends here. So, um, as Jack introduced a while ago, um, I'm an um, expert on uh, shipwreck studies, and especially in the Asian regions. So today's uh, my talks um, focus on um, archaeological evidence of the ships engaged on the maritime Silk Route tradings. And first of part of this pre presentation, I'll we'll just give an overview um, on the state of shipwreck archaeological studies with some examples of excavated ships in Southeast Asia and um, um, related to um, the ships, um, the showing um, originally from the origin of the ships um, uh, from Indian Ocean world. And we will explain some Southeast Asian boat building um, tradition from the archaeological evidence and uh, uh, give some idea of uh, what is um, Indian Ocean ship building technology is based on archaeological evidence. And um, the second part of my presentation 
reintroduce um, um, my ongoing research with Japanese colleagues, um, shipwrecks and um, associated cargoes, um, including trading ceramics found in Vietnam, um, because these ships uh, relate the, um, I believe, uh, we believe maritime ship group trading heavily. So, um, by, give, by examining these ships, um, you may understand um, the um, idea of what the Southeast Asian uh, shipbuilding technologies in more details, and with comparison of uh, East, Asia, uh, East Indian Ocean uh, ship, um, ships at that time. So, um, all these ships are actually uh, more prominent in, in forming a sort of group, um, highly actively, um, highly um, actively involved on the maritime ship route trading through the most of the time of the first millennia um, before the advent of Chinese traders in South China Sea trading. So, um, yesterday we addressed this. Um, basic um, sort of idea of uh, silk route, maritime silk routes, and uh, we address like um, um, uh, some idea of how uh, she lanes are stretched based on uh, historical um, records such as uh, Periplus and other documents. So people here um, agree um, probably the discovery of uh, seasonal monsoon was an important event and um, to cross the Indian Ocean, and which is actually the third largest water in the world. And um, uh, by discovering uh, seasonal monsoons, people just, um, um, people got the way to cross the seas. And, uh, but our questions um, here, probably, how the waters uh, has, his, uh, has been, uh, have historically been highway connecting to the other maritime space, and such as um, Asian waters, so if the, uh, the water's divided by um, land and uh, if the monsoon patterns are different in each water, so um, um, that must uh, be understood um, to address this um, development of um, the sea lanes. So um, the final destination of early uh, seafarers um, uh, to cross the Indian Ocean, they, um, they tried to reach the uh, southern coast of China. Um, if I understand correctly, um, yes, uh, yesterday's um, we, we focus on the idea of um, early maritime ship route trade between first and third century, and um, some discussion in more um, focused on the western side of the ship road. So today's my talks more about eastern side of uh, maritime ship route a little bit later period. So. Um, this, the slide show the proposed she routes uh, was studied by um, Hughes and published in 1882. And uh, this um, map gave, gives us the idea of ancient she trade that connecting to China. So there was two different colors uh, here. The two lines on the slide is actually um, in case indicating the uh, major sea routes um, passed by use and red line indicates the route um, existed um, through the most time of the first millennia and um, along the uh, land route. But eventually the seafarers found more direct voyage uh, route across the Bay of Bengal and blue lines actually indicate the later period, the Voyager's um, route, probably dating back to the 8th and 9th centuries. So um, the Europe reconstructed um, these route based on uh, Periplus and uh, Ptolemy geographical tables and topographical question of cosmos and um, some Arabic um, resources like even contrabatas and um, tribal records. So uh, these are the primary sources. And of course, there are some uh, Chinese sources um, that we can rely on to understand the ancient Chi route. Um, basically, um, these record um, are Xi journeys recorded by a Buddhist monk trying to reach to um, India. Um, and they recorded some port 
and these pods being studied. The most representative port uh, we already addressed, like um, Okeo in the uh, Indochina, uh, in China uh, Peninsula, uh, the port of Funan Kingdom. And so if, um, based on this historical um, context, uh, we understand uh, the sea route as well as the location of the port. Well, and somehow there's a bit of inaccuracy in the east side um, port because some Greek and uh, Greco-Roman sources really uh, didn't provide um, accurate information of the location of Chinese port. So it's a bit um, imbalance you can see here. Um, but um, yesterday, as we also agree, um, there was an important um, seaport between um, the uh, west and east, um, like um, Sri Lanka. The, the Sri Lanka had some important ports. So early settlers in Sri Lanka actually um, could infer in the voyage sailing in the Indian Ocean, and later uh, the Sri Lanka itself um, came to be prominent because of some um, trading product produced there. And Sri Lanka could um, produce some marine sources and pearls and high quality cinnamons. And Chinese historical document uh, records Sri Lanka as country of cinnamon. And uh, Fashien, the Buddhist pilgrim, conducted journey from China, India, and Sri Lanka in uh, 411. And his return journey from Sri Lanka to China between 413 and 414, um, it's clear that he took a sea route and appeared to be taken passage into Indian South. Um, the, he used basically Indian and Southeast Asian ships. So um, there's a question: What kind of boat the Fashien used? Um, the Sri Lanka um, yesterday um, we had a bit of image um, of this important port uh, located in southern part of Sri Lanka, um, the village, the a small fishing village, if I understand correctly, in southern coast of Sri Lanka, is known as Godawaya. But uh, we also know there's a long, uh, long settlements in these areas, and, the, and it's probably uh, the people agree that being uh, served as hub port and um, based on the archaeological evidence. And um, to support um, the archaeological evidence, we will, um, we will address um, the maritime archaeologists in Sri Lanka being working on these shipwrecks um, in lately. Or well, actually, the archaeological mission started in 2000. And, um, so uh, maritime archaeologists in Sri Lanka um, been working in southern coast, and they actually originally worked in um, God, uh, Gold Harbor, um, but eventually the discovery of Godawaya Lexa just remarked, and then um, the people being uh, started uh, work on this site. Uh, Lek was identified um, about four kilometers southeast of Godawaya, and. Um, and the depth of the water is more than uh, 30 meters, was relatively deep, so recovered artifacts, including uh, some jars and stone benches and cooking bathrooms and the glass ingots, as shown on the photographs. And um, so these um, actually um, indicated um, the early Indian or uh, not Indian, if not Indian ships, then the ships from different regions are heavily engaged on the uh, glass material trading. So what type of ships? Unfortunately, it's only a small portion of the Uttun remains survived, so we don't know. Um, we still don't know uh, what types of ships um, actually carry these glass ingots. So the questions uh, for us, um, um, especially between the 1st and 5th century um, AD, um, we have very limited uh, information um, about the ship actually engaged on Ar East Indian Ocean trade. So we have a very, um, the archaeological uh, information is limited. Uh, we have uh, information from Ajanta Caves and describing the 5th century um, trading ships, or Indic ship. And uh, we have some sort of image um, of Ari um, Indic Indian Ocean trader. So you can see um, it's already um, formed some sort of sea ships. 
Um, it has you know, three mast with uh, bipod and there's um, uh, four mast. And um, uh, it obviously has a good cargo carrying capacity. As you can see, the, uh, some jars in the stern side and back, of, back part of the ships. And um, the ship was uh, controlled by uh, what is called the quota ladders on the side of the ships. Uh, it didn't show any actual ladder located in the center of the ships. So the quota ladders were um, for uh, maneuverability, that's for sure. So these are the only evidence. And so, and for these, um, so the que next question is, um, how far these Indian ships went to um, toward the east? Um, this type of ship reached the Southeast Asia or not? And um, we don't know. Well, um, the fifth century, um, they could reach at least the Malay Peninsula. Um, that's um, my assumption. And, um, the Malay Peninsula is marginal kind of strip of Indian Oceans and separating, um, separating Indian Ocean from the South um, Asian waters. In some sense, um, it could be the contact point and the Malay Peninsula. Um, there have been uh, some contact point um, for um, the two large maritime spaces. And one of the contact point, uh, we can presume what could on Tom, this was, um, this site was also mentioned yesterday already. What Kulontong is located in the Kulabi province in the middle of the Malay Peninsula. So Kulabi actually occupied the bottleneck part of the uh, peninsula, sided by Andaman Sea and the water of the Thai Gulf. And site um, at the Wat Kulontong is known as uh, Kunon Lukpat, which actually means uh, bees mountain, grass bees mountain. So um, there was some um, various artifacts. Um, and apart from these artifacts, numerous, uh, numerous, many grass bees are actually excavated on the side. And archaeological evidence suggests that uh, settlement of this site, um, probably uh, dating back to the fourth century and uh, onward. So there's some of the photographs of uh, the grass uh, materials excavated at the site, lots and grass bees and some coins, and um, the coins depict some future of uh, trading ships. And um, we pleasure not only the Wat Kulontong, but there are, there could be other um, the meeting point along the west coast of the Malay Peninsula. And I personally explored the, uh, some of the port along the west coast of Malay Peninsula, and though, um, um, I found um, the iron anchors um, in one of the sites near the Wat Kulontong, um, but um, in different provinces, it's called uh, Tulam province in southern Thailand. Um, the, uh, this type of iron anchor is very similar to Indian Ocean type of anchor. Um, the, uh, the photograph on the right side is actually the anchor found in Sri Lanka. So um, the arms, uh, four arms are perpendicularly penetrate in, in um, um, the sh shank of the anchor. So this is uh, Indian Ocean tradition. So um, Indian ships probably approached to um, the uh, west coast of Malian Peninsula uh, by the 5th century early. Uh, what is interesting is actually um, the, the number of ship timbers uh, discovered um, um, in the site. But um, these ship timbers show more boat building tradition in Southeast Asia. So we presume by the fifth, fifth century, um, Southeast Asian boat building tradition also arrived at the maturity of construction of sea going ships. And to construct uh, sea going ships, the uh, ship carpenters in Southeast Asian regions, perhaps uh, with some influence from Indian Ocean developed a unique technologies. So I'm going to explain just uh, quickly the unique techniques uh, of Southeast Asian boat building techniques. So it's, it's a Southeast, Southeast Asian boat building techniques that are um, uh, unique with that planking method. And they didn't use really the metal fastening like uh, iron nails. Instead, they used that uh, uh, dwells. So the collecting planks by dwells was um, the, one of the unique tradition. 
Another tradition relates the transverse strings with the flames, so it joined planks with the doors. Um, they basically constructed the planks fast. It's called a, a, a plank fast um, construction techniques. So the plank fast construction techniques in, um, it's recognized as uh, older techniques. Then uh, the Southeast Asian boat builders uh, introduced a flame into the into the inside the hull by uh, technique. It's called the lash lock techniques. So um, these techniques um, is endemic to um, Southeast Asian um, boat building techniques. You can see a, a, a kind of um, the shape of uh, protrusions um, that cut inside of the ship timbers. And so uh, these pro, uh, protrusions um, for um, to, to place uh, the flames on top of and there's um, a number of um, lash lag construction techniques being observed on excavated ships in Southeast Asia. Um, the, sh the photographs from Philippines and there's um, other examples from Indonesia. It, uh, the ships are uh, excavated in northern part of Java. Um, it's the ship name is called Punjor Harjo. Um, you can see um, how the flames uh, inside the house placed on top of um, a kind of square-shaped um, protrusions um, inside the hull. And there's a number of examples from Southeast Asia showing these techniques. Uh, more than 15 examples, I counted, and it's scattered. And some are from land side, and some are from um, some example from underwater. Uh, the slide show the 10th century Chirabon shipwrecks um, it was found off the coast of Java with number of artifacts. So this is Southeast Asian uh, boat building technology. Um, we know not only Southeast Asian technologies, um, the, uh, by the 7th century at least a number of Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean uh, type of ships appeared in the South China Sea. Uh, so, um, the one of the examples, like a Beriton shipwreck, we probably people in here um, have known about this ship. The Beriton shipwreck uh, was found in Java Seas and dated to the 8th and 9th centuries. And another example uh, later came was um, from Thailand, uh, Phantom Three ships in found in the delta of the Thailand. So that's also dated to the early uh, Dwaravati period around the seventh century. And so these are two examples, not Southeast Asian boat, uh, boat but a more Indian Ocean uh, type boat. A Belton shipwreck found in, um, the, from the ninth century, discovered in 1998, and just um, water, three kilo, only three kilometers off the coast of Belton Island in Indonesia. And the wreck cargo is, is said to consist of more than 60,000 artifacts, including a large number of ceramics from various kilns in North and South China. Changsha Ware, Yue Ware, Xin Ware, and Go Xin Ware. And uh, the Australian researcher reconstructed the uh, original size of the ships. It was about 18.5 um, uh, meter long and 6.5 uh, meter wide, uh, with a displacement of 55 tons. And this display placement um, gave at least 25 tonnage of cargo carrying capacity. And so um, it's interesting, uh, 7th century actually um, recognized as um, the period when um, the network of um, the Southeast Asian and East Asian Silk Route are more tightly linked. Um, so you can see, um, example from here, um, the Changsha Ware excavated uh, Beriton shipwrecks and shown on the photograph in the left, um, and the jar, um, the similar type of jar was actually excavated in the uh, southern part of Japan in, in Harbor City, it's called the Hakata. So um, we know there's a number of Changsha ceramics were excavated um, in from the uh, Beritone shipwrecks, and the ship was actually um, tried to reach um, the port in Indonesia. 
but the, uh, the carrying cargoes um, was market was um, actually not only in Southeast Asia, but also in East Asia. So people um, um, understand how expansion of maritime silk, network, uh, silk route networks happened around 8th century and 9th century, you know, probably before that. And here is a um, uh, representative artifact from the Beritian shipwreck. Um, this is a um, um, similar design of Euro, but not made of um, the ceramics, but made of copper. And this is a, a collection from Horyuji Temple in Nara in Japan. So you can see the design, um, the, similar, uh, the similarity in the designs. So um, the cargo of the Belgian shipwrecks people consider it's particularly for the Southeast Asian or uh, more the uh, Western world, but not um, there's actually the market uh, existed in East Asia as well. So unfortunately, um, the hull of the Belgian shipwreck no longer remains. But the excavation of 9th century um, Phantom Three ships found in Thailand are probably um, compensated for the loss of the Belgian shipwrecks. The hull excavated in uh, Thai estuaries, about 30 meter long ships, and um, show the similar techniques that used in the Belgian shipwrecks. Um, this is large ships. The, uh, when I visited the site in 2014, uh, the keelson of the ship was just to recover. It showed um, at least 18 meter long, and uh, the size of the original ships probably is bigger than um, the Belgian shipwrecks um, the people consider. And however, the techniques in, um, used. Um, to construct these ships is very similar to the Belgian shipwrecks. It's called as um, edge sawn techniques. So the planks are uh, um, edge joint planks are sawn by uh, koya uh, stitching, and then um, tightly connected. So this is very much um, Indian Ocean world um, shipbuilding construction techniques, and still um, we can. Um, find these techniques in today's Oman and some western part of Indian Ocean. Now from the, from the shipwrecks, there are some uh, broken pieces of 12 feet of shed and ivory and Islamic jar shed were recovered. Unfortunately, um, this ship uh, didn't um, produce lots of artifact. Um, the ship was pretty much empty. So um, we only know uh, that, uh, what type of ships these are. And um, however, um, interesting fact, um, in Thailand, this ship is recognized as Arab ships because the Belgian shipwrecks are always called Arab, Arab ships. A uh, recent uh, study by John Guy is actually he addressed about the, uh, uh, one of the inscript on the uh, ceramics jar shed uh, that's showing um, Pafrebi script. So the Pafrebi um, script is um, used uh, more in uh, Sasanian uh, Empire period. So it's a more like um, recognized as a Persian official language. And interestingly, um, this, the other example from Japan, um, the sandalwood was trading uh, materials at the time around the 7th and 8th century, um, was dedicated to the Holy Uj Temple. Uh, it also uh, showed the inscription of Pafrebi language. So it's a personal name, so inscribed on trading material was uh, probably uh, was um, kind of custom, and so trading materials they just um, water off the beach along the Chautam village, and so local people discovered a number of Tan Dynasty ceramics uh, with the remains of ship timber. Um, just to give an idea of the location of uh, where the ship was discovered. And it was discovered in a uh, province, it's called um, the Kwarnai province in central um, Vietnam. And you can see the, the beach in Red Circle and just um, and near the beach, actually, if you can um, take a, a Google Earth very carefully, you actually can see a little bit uh, square shape. 
So um, if you know uh, a bit of history of Vietnam, um, in central Vietnam, there's a kingdom of um, Champa, which recognized as a maritime kingdom. So um, this is a, a sh remains of the walls and mold of the Shtadar of Champa kingdom. So the beach is not that far from the Shtadars, and you can see the island. So you can see it kind of maritime landscape that consists of um, the Shtadar as a main city, <coughs> and trading port, and there's an island. Um, which was probably a landmark for sailors. So the Cham kingdoms are always uh, based in, in along this kind of uh, landscape in central Vietnam. So the discover ceramics, um, actually um, Tan China ceramics from Changsha Tongan Kirins, Yue Kirins, and um, uh, Shang Wears, and the, the little bit similar assemblage um, that we understand, um, the ceramic assemblage um, of the Bariton shipwreck. But um, there was, of course, difference. You can see the number of uh, Changsha wear with the motif of the splash wear. So the splash wear is a kind of popular motif um, that adopted by um, people in the Kirin in Changsha regions and because of the popularity, you know, actually people in the Middle East produce a number of copies of Changsha ware in the Middle East. And so uh, left side from the Chao Tan shipwreck, we working in Vietnam and right side a uh, copy of Changsha ware. Uh, it's actually um, from the, uh, the collection from the uh, museum in the Copenhagen in Denmark. So we found a number of splash wear from these ships. Not only the, um, the uniqueness of splash wear, but um, the ceramics discovered in this shipwreck. Um, we found a number of inscriptions um, on, on them, at least 147 insides, insides the inscription being identified mainly in um, in Chinese where um, other inscript, including Arabic and Indic, and um, other unknown inscript. So those are some examples of ink inscript with um, Arabic language instead um, um, with the sorry with the style of Davide you can see in 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 the bottom. So we understand the involvement of a Jewish merchant that used Arabic language uh, probably on board, on board on this ship. Um, so by the seventh century, um, the date of this shipwrecks um, from, uh, based on radiocarbon dating on ship timber, we consider it seventh and eighth century trading ships. So by the uh, seventh and eighth century, the people from uh, different regions are actually um, hired one ships and then stop in different port and they carry the goods from different places. So the kind of trading system established by the time. So um, there's a, um, oh, in our team, there's an expert um, who is studying this Indic inscript and he, he had a very, he very had an idea uh, what in, in inscription described actually. Um, the one of the inscriptions um, show the name of Ambalak, uh, which is the name of a city in Iran. So the merchant from this region may be on the boat. Um, the same character could be read um, as um, um, Traveler's Water, so there's a, a bit of discussion on, on these ink inscriptions. And the Chao Tan ships, actually, the original size of the ships is more than 25 meters, and the keel length is 23 meters, and edge joint plant with Uttun Royal showing Southeast Asian uh, boat building tradition. And um, as ship building um, expert, I've been analyzing these ship timbers, so there are a, a number of hard plugs and flames and some anchors. 
So um, the, these timber are recovered by local collectors, so archaeologically not recorded, so I had to um, analyze ship and have to do, uh, had to do recording work and use a, a technique called the photogrammetry recording on this uh, chart and shipwreck timbers for 3D reconstructions and um, figured out uh, the number of um, how many wooden dwellers are uh, used, for example, on this ship timbers and for reconstruction. And then, uh, hold on a sec. So just to um, give the idea of um, the size of 7th and 8th century, the Southeast Asian trading ships. And this is a model of 3D reconstruction of the ship. Oops, sorry. Today, I just brought a three, uh, small scale model of these three pieces of uh, hill timbers. Unfortunately, when local collector recovered this uh, hill timber, the keels are the back um, bone of the ships. So um, the local collector just chopped in three pieces, unfortunately. So uh, just an um, idea of. So the central Vietnam is an interesting place. Um, what I talked to is um, the evidence of Southeast Asian trader approach to the central coast, um, the, the coast of central Vietnam. But not only the Southeast Asian ship, um, we believe um, the number of Indian Ocean probably ship approach to the coast of central Vietnam. Um, such evidence actually um, we can see um, by discovering uh, anchor that belonged to um, Indian Ocean type of ship. So um, we are searching a seabed of these areas now, and um, there's more report of discovery of Changsha ceramic bowls. So there are a number of potentials in these areas. I just um, um, the conclusion. Um, so the archaeological evidence at least suggests um, there are two distinctive types of ships uh, heavily involved on transportation of sheep on commodity of maritime silk route. So the dominance of these ships on the interregional shipping in the South China Sea has become prominent by the 7th century. So um, what I discussed, um, uh, we really don't, don't have archaeological evidence of the ships um, dating back to, let's say, uh, first and fifth century. But uh, by the seventh century, it seemed to be there's a um, sort of a standardization of shipbuilding technologies. The standardization of shipbuilding technologies uh, actually um, um, we can uh, identify two distinctive type of two distinctive type of ships. One uh, based in Southeast Asian boat building techniques, and another um, based on the East in, uh, India Ocean uh, boat building techniques. Uh, we have to be very careful about what and how we define what is Southeast Asian ships and what's Indian Ocean ships, as as um, um, as mentioned. Some Indian Ocean ship discovered in Southeast Asia was constructed by uh, using Southeast Asian um, timber species. So there's a, um, the techniques probably spread from Indian Ocean to Southeast Asia, and then a uh, local ship carpenter adapted the technology. So um, I try to uh, generalize the idea here, but um, um, probably um, so we should carefully argue the definition of uh, the ships and also who actually engaged on um, the shipping and also the tradings. Um, we have to separate the idea of uh, sailors from merchant, I mean, um, Jewish merchant involved on 
uh, maritime crude trading, and they, they are supported by Southeast Asian ships. So um, the kind of ideals have to be carefully uh, argued. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kimura. Our second speaker is Dr. Derek Heng, who was one of my former college professors who inspired me to become a historian. Dr. Heng is professor and chair of the Department of History at Northern Arizona University. His research focuses on the economic and diplomatic history of maritime South Asia and the South China Sea during the first and early second millennium AD and the asymmetrical relationship between coastal port states in South Asia and tier one states in China and the Indian subcontinent. Dr. Heng is the author of Sino-Malay Trade and Diplomacy in the 10th to 14th centuries. He is currently writing a monograph entitled Anatomy of a Port City, Settlement Cultures of Island South Asia in the Early Second Millennium AD, which seeks to construct the characteristics of pre-modern port cities of island South Asia using urban geograph geographical approaches. His paper this morning is entitled Reconstructing Demographics, Social Hierarchies and Ethnicity in the Early Second Millennium AD Port Cities in the Malacca Straits Region. Dr. Hay. I'm just share with you a working research that um, I'm, I'm doing right now as part of the uh, monograph that I'm trying to write as uh, Jack had introduced and really sort of looking at the urban sort of um, layout demographics of uh, coastal port cities in Southeast Asia uh, where in general there is an absence of um, very good or detailed textual material and so the archaeology becomes one of those sort of sources of information that we have to rely on significantly in order to try to paint um, a picture. Um, so for today's uh, paper, I'm really sort of looking at the uh, coastal settlement patterns in uh, island Southeast Asia, but primarily, great, thank you, primarily centered on the Straits of Malacca um, here, here we go, um, and uh, where there has been significant archaeological research over the sort of last half century to six decades where um, a lot of materials have been excavated in quite a number of these sites which are noted, uh, denoted in these, by these red dots. Um, many of these sites do not really have any monumental architecture at all and if they do, they're sort of pretty um, small examples or insignificant examples like this. Uh, the bigger sort of bulk of the archaeological data really are in the small finds, so some metals, for example, floor, fauna finds, uh, and of course, um, other sort of imperishable material, including um, ceramics. So, as we think about that, and over the last couple of decades, and you have a standardization of uh, the archaeological practice, you actually have um, a development of a vocabulary and classification system that is pretty uh, well sort of shared within the fraternity of Southeast Asian archaeology. And one of the things that that allows us to do then, therefore, is to actually create uh, the opportunities for sort of cross-site comparisons uh, where we look at not just the types of data, but also the uh, quantitative uh, data for each of these different um, categories. Um, so hitherto, I think the reconstruction of coastal settlements in the Malacca Straits region has been taken through two very broad approaches. The first one being sort of a geographical uh, theoretical approach, uh, utilizing primarily two frameworks, one being the port of trade uh, concept that was developed in the 50s by Carl Polanyi, where you, know, you have goods and people sort of centered in one particular settlement, uh, and then these materials are exchanged within that sort of trading population, uh, as well as the resident population in a port city. Uh, the other geographical framework, which has a greater geographical sort of um, extent, as it were, uh, would pertain to the dendritic approach, where you have a riverine system, 
a port city, for example, at the river mouth, and then as you go upstream, um, the, dis the distribution of products from the inland with the imported products, you know, there's an exchange, and you sort of try to map out um, the macro level sort of uh, economic patterns, as it were, and the interactive patterns uh, upstream and downstream, and how it, it has implications basically uh, on the international trade and the other uh, way around. So that's the first approach. The second approach uh, is a little bit more sort of, um, I want to say, uh, uh, biased in, in approach, mainly because uh, what it does is it tries to marry the textual material with the archaeological data. Uh, and one of the things that happens, of course, is that you sort of reconstruct what an ideal port settlement is in the Malay or Malacca Straits region based on the textual material that are existing from that particular geographical region sort of written culture. And from that ideal model, you then use the archaeological data to test to see which aspects of that uh, actually hold true for a particular example, which ones are not there. Uh, and so in some ways, it's a heterogenetic approach uh, where you're sort of, you know, sort of scoring the different check, check boxes, as it were. Uh, but very often, what ends up happening is the model pushes the data uh, as opposed to the other way around. So what I like to do today really is to sort of use the archaeological data uh, of small finds from two um, case examples, one being in South Kedah in the Malay Peninsula, uh, and the other one being uh, Singapore in the 14th century, to see if we can actually... Uh, elucidate from the um, archaeological data of small finds to sort of reconstruct uh, notions of settlement patterns, uh, demographic differences, and so on and so forth. Uh, the aim, obviously, is to try to see if we can actually develop some kind of like ethnic different nuances as opposed to distinct differences, because most of the time what we do find is that the subgroups that do inhabit some of these settlements actually have access to all the materials and so the question is varying degrees and whether or not we can actually tease out some of the nuances in terms of the distinctions in activities and consumption uh, patterns. So the two cases that I'll be looking at today would be um, South Kedah, uh, which is here, let me just do a, a larger map first. Uh, so the Sungai Bujang settlement area in South Kedah, which was dated to the 12th to the 14th centuries, uh, and the Masik, which is in Singapore Island, uh, that's dated to the, 4th, uh, the 14th um, century. Uh, both sites are interesting and also uh, quite different in terms of the archaeological data that's available. Uh, for Sungai Bujang, um, what we do have is about... 70 years of excavation, quite a lot of reports, but unfortunately, uh, not a huge amount of quantitative data. So there's a lot of descriptive data, but not enough, uh, not, uh, not a lot of quantitative data. In the case of Singapore, we do have some sites where we've done samples and post-excavation analysis uh, where there is some quantitative data. So they both are somewhat different. Uh, and in some ways, the, the data does drive the way that we can actually look at how we can reconstruct uh, these two sites. So to begin with, um, the Sungai Bujang site, uh, which is located on the northwest part of uh, Peninsula Malaysia, um, is a very well-known site in, uh, for island Southeast Asian settlement studies. Um, there are about approximately 40 excavations that have been done over here over the last um, seven um, decades. Um, and the results are quite interesting in terms of the classification of the set settlement material culture. Um, five main uh, type uh, profiles of remains, uh, I think, have been sort of, you know, sort of um, worked out uh, categorically by archaeologists who have worked on these sites and they are as follows over there at the bottom. So you have complex material remains with glass, which involves the importation or the existence of uh, international material culture, but primarily ceramics, but also glass shirts, uh, which both come from the South China Sea, including China, as well as from across the Bay of Bengal, um, including uh, places like India. Uh, and um, the roulette ware, for example, from South Asia. Um, you also have a second profile that really sort of just recognizes the presence of beads, primarily glass beads uh, or Indo-Pacific type beads, 
um, that do show up in a number of these sites, but not a lot. Um, and then you have a liminally sort of decreasing uh, profiles of international uh, material or foreign material, including the presence of only trade and domestic ceramics uh, or trade ceramics only, and then eventually coming down to only sort of domestic ceramics, which are the earthenware that is produced uh, in the Southeast Asian tradition. And if you put all those profiles on the maps in terms of the sites that have been excavated at um, Sungai Bujang, this is basically what we're looking at. Three key clusters of areas where you can see settlement patterns, area one, two, and three. Um, and unfortunately, the map doesn't show you the topography as you move from the mouth of the river estuary upwards, basically what we're doing is we're going uphill. Uh, and right at the top here, beyond, beyond this part of the map, uh, is a, is, 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 they, they call it a mountain, but really it's a very, very high hill. hill. So it's sort of a very up, you know, it's sort of an up, uphill incline as we uh, move up. So the topography up here, for example, is fairly different from the one over here, which is relatively flat. Um, and of course, there's a central part uh, in, this, in this area where we have um, just some excavated sites, but relatively uh, little material culture. The entire site is not very big. It's only about four kilometers long. Uh, but one, one of the interesting observations, obviously, is that even within that short distance, you actually see segments of different kinds of settlement patterns and different subgroups um, that exist. Uh, in, in this place. So some, just some photographs of some of the finds that uh, have been excavated in this, this settlement site. Um, glass, for example, um, these are uh, Chinese ceramics uh, of what we call the storage jar type. Uh, so they're coarse ceramics um, that were primarily utilized for the storage and transportation of foodstuffs or smaller, uh, more fragile ceramics, uh, other types of um, international products that were uh, recovered in this place include uh, storage jars like this, for example, and much smaller ones, presumably utilized for uh, carrying um, slightly heavier, um, higher density items. Both of these are actually from, 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 from Chinese kilns uh, located in um, the province of Guangdong and, and Fujian. Uh, where the two major international ports were located, the port of Guangzhou uh, and Quanzhou. Uh, uh, some of the examples of the beads, and I do apologize that the images are not any, any better, um, but um, the large majority of which are sort of what we would probably classify as Indo-Pacific beads, uh, although there are some beads that are made of other kinds of materials as well that have been excavated uh, at the sites located here. And this is uh, sort of a close-up of some of these um, glass, these beads that we're looking at uh, here. So, what can be said about you know sort of some of the more rudimentary nature of um, you know subgroup sort of patterns, as it were, based on the consumption and the level of demand that sort of um, maintained by uh, the settlements uh, in this particular uh, site. So, firstly, I think one of the things that we Recognize obviously is that there are three um, key areas uh, here, and in some ways, uh, separated by ge geography and space. Um, although the area is relatively compressed, if we really think about the amount of space that we are looking at. So, um, in terms of area A, uh, we we are primarily looking at a very very complex material cultural sort of society. Uh, with a significant amount of international products that are consumed. The other thing, of course, is that um, there is a hierarchy in terms of the urban layout uh, and the settlement pattern, primarily centered around sites, sites number 18 uh, and 82, where that is the richest and the densest in terms of the material cultural remains. But as you move down this way, as well as up this way, um, the density becomes uh, lower and lower, and also the amount of material culture that is imported becomes less and less complex. Uh, it moves from having glass beads, glass shirts, and international ceramics to 
basically just looking at international ceramics, uh, and as we move up, uh, it becomes less and less. The second segment being area two, where um, we are looking at almost very, very little uh, imported products. Uh, and if there are um, any finds, they tend in general to be uh, domestic ceramics of so this location here, for example, and over here. And you have this weird thing up, up here uh, where it kind of mirrors this urban center here. Uh, and it looks like what might be happening is there actually is a plant or a, uh, a, a, a settlement that's sort of been sent up from um, area A. So mirroring area A quite significantly, but located quite far up the river, in presumably so that you could actually be in contact with the groups that are settled in this upper reach of the River Rhine system. Um, and the third group being up here, uh, where you have complex material cultural remains with glass, but the density is not as high as down here in area one. And so the assumption is that you are not necessarily looking at an economically asymmetrical relationship as you go further up uh, the, the river estuary, where, but um, the fact that it's fairly evenly sort of located in terms of a spatial distribution uh, and in terms of the profile of the remains suggests that these, the settlement, the groups in, in this area uh, are not as hierarchically structured as in area one and also probably relatively egalitarian. So what are some of the things that we can think about as we look at this? I think in the first instance, um, what we are seeing is a hierarchical differentiation um, primarily here, whereas we don't get that up there. And that is interesting because from a social point of view, this suggests that these two groups are actually different, even though they're part of a whole settlement that traverses this entire river estuary. The second thing that is really interesting is that um, as we move up here, um, the glass beads sort of no longer quite show up. Uh, and that ha suggests to us that in terms of the aesthetics, of um, these groups that are located along the river estuary, whereas in area A, um, aesthetic taste that may be related to the consumption, for example, of glass beads, which may be related to things like body ornamentation, for example, and a preference for um, you know, Indian Ocean uh, sort of aesthetic items, the groups that are located up here in the upper reaches of the reef river do not necessarily exhibit that preference. And so again, socially, we might be looking at a different sort of subgroup of people, even though they are within uh, the same sort of settlement area. The third one that's really interesting is this part here. Um, and, and that is that this, the subgroups that are located here seem to be the most difficult to pin down uh, if, they, if we do have material sort of evidence for them, they tend in general to be domestic ceramics, uh, which is pretty common in Southeast, in island Southeast Asia, but, but then you don't have any other sort of material culture that sort of suggests what they might be more aligned to, whether they might be more aligned to groups that are located here or aligned to groups located up there. So um, the groups that are here, appear to operate very distinctly in terms of their cultural sort of, you know, consumption and aesthetic sort of taste. Um, and so what we are seeing in this particular uh, settlement site uh, are three different groups that do not necessarily share the same cultural sort of outlook uh, and consumption patterns, but nonetheless, um, do have the opportunity to sort of share that same material culture. Um, and this is interesting because this site actually uh, extends over about four kilometers. And the question, of course, is there is an absence of quantitative data. But if we did have the quantitative data, what would we be looking at? And how might, might we be able to tell certain sorts of um, demographic differences uh, much better than this site? And that's really sort of where we come to Singapore. 
So one of the challenges that we have in island Southeast Asia, and part of the book project sort of really trying to work on that, is to see if we can actually derive quantitative data that will allow us to do intersite comparisons. Um, as that last example has shown, we can actually talk about some of these differences, but they're all very generalistic. Uh, in some ways, they're sort of a macro level sort of perspective. Um, the, the presence of um, more detailed quantitative data actually allows us to do some very interesting um, work, uh, which we've not previously been able to do. So this is the map of the island of Singapore. Uh, and there was a 14, uh, late 13th to 14th century settlement that was sort of located in this part of the island. Um, and over the last 30 years, there has been about maybe, I want to say 12 now, excavations that have been done in this part of the downtown area. Uh, and so you can see that it's actually a very sort of intense urban environment. Uh, and so it's very interesting from an archaeological perspective. It, um, you, you, you usually only have about two months to work, and, it's, and usually it's just before the site is completely ripped up and destroyed permanently because you're trying to build an underground car park there, you know, a 25-story building or something like that. Uh, but there are 12 excavations that have been conducted in this particular part of downtown uh, as part of an ongoing um, excavation research, archaeological research on the 14th century settlement uh, in Singapore. The bulk of the material that has been excavated over the last 30 years, about 10 tons or so of um, small finds have really sort of not been uh, looked at in great detail. But we've done some sampling for four sites and so we've got some detailed information uh, that we, we can actually look at. One of the challenges, I think, about looking at Singapore is that it's, it's been referred to in Malay textual uh, history as sort of like one of the precursors of the ideal of a Malay Sultanate. And the textual material sort of gives you a description of what the port looks like, what the palace looks like, you know, and that it has to be a hill. Uh, and then there's a plain area, and there's a body of water next to it, so that ships could be there. Uh, and so, and even the demography as well, which are the groups that are involved in the body politic of the of the kingdom. And so, because of that, there's a sort of like a textually reconstructed framework that we often use, and it kind of looks somewhat like that. Um, the archaeological data tends, in general, to be sort of you know pushed into a hole to sort of fit some of these uh, models that we've got. Uh, and very often, the analysis tends, in general, to be fairly uh, anecdotal. Um, what quantitative data allows us to do is to actually, um, in some ways, either confirm or refute this particular model. And so uh, we're going to use uh, for this, at least for the rest of this case example, um, two types of small finds, fine ceramics and coarse ceramics. Uh, in um, fine ceramics, we're really sort of looking at only three major types of ceramics, uh, blue and white, white ware and green ware. These three types are the most prolific, uh, and in terms of the amount that you can excavate, they actually are the largest uh, for, for most sites in Southeast Asia of this particular period, the 14th century. And so they provide a very sort of nice sort of body of material uh, that sort of, at least to some extent, helps to mitigate some of the issues that might come uh, from quantitative analysis. So blue and white ceramics are interesting. In the 14th century, most of what we see uh, very, very commonly uh, tend to come from the 15th century and later. Uh, but blue and white ceramics, although already in production, in very, very small scale uh, examples by about the 9th century, really the production of uh, blue and white ceramics uh, go into full swing around about the late 13th into the 14th century. Uh, at this point in time, the, um, the blue, I don't know if you said the blue is really blue. Um, and that's really interesting because uh, the cobalt in, tends to come from two places, but predominantly from the Middle East, although Yunnan is also a second supply of the cobalt, which is the reason why you get some of these, like black, because, um, there's some uh, mineral impurities in there. But they're very select. They produce in the, uh, Jiang, the, the Jiangxi province and uh, in the, the Jintezheng kilns and 
they are in general because of the select nature of the production, uh, the use of cobalt, uh, and uh, the finesse of these decorations, they tend in general to be probably the most expensive ceramics that were exported to Southeast Asia during this period of time. Um, they are not common. Uh, they can be found, but they are not as, you know, sort of, you know, they're, they're not, in terms of the quantities, they're not as, as, as many or numerous as some of the other ceramics uh, that we see. Um, the second category is whiteware. And whiteware is um, produced or was produced in the first half of the second millennium AD in the southeast Chinese provinces, particularly in the province of Guangdong. Uh, there are three main types. One is the uh, Qingpai or Yingqing, which is, you know, these, these are just some examples that were excavated in the sites in Singapore. Um, this is a second example, which is specific to the 14th century, is in the shape of a star fruit or a belimbing, and uh, has sort of copper oxide spots that uh, sort of you know sort of dotted on on it. And when you see items like that, it's you know it's sort of roughly about the 14th century. It's very specific to that century, uh, and also tehua as well, which is produced in Fujian Province, quite far inland. It's a very special um, whiteware ceramic. Um, and so the demand uh, and the supply is very, um, very select. Uh, what is interesting about whiteware is that the peak of whiteware production in Chi in, in, from the Chinese perspective in terms of the manufacturing economy really comes in the 12th century and it starts to go into decline from about the 13th century onwards. So although whiteware was still produced uh, in the 14th century, uh, the, this is what we call a receding kind of uh, product. And it's becoming less and less uh, important uh, and produced, you know, in terms of these quantities, they, they, they were producing less and less by the time we got to the 14th century. The real bulk of the Chinese ceramics that was produced in the 14th century are the green wares. Uh, and so Celadon, for example, from the Longchuen kilns, the very famous ones, uh, and that's one, it's about this big, so they were, you know, these, some of these items are pretty large and robust. Uh, but also other kilns, for example, in nearby kilns uh, near to Longchen in, in Zhejiang, which produced the Saladin glazes, uh, but were clearly different from this type. And then the sort of less, um, what, what, uh, what we would call the, the less valuable type that were produced by the provincial kilns, both in Fujian uh, and Guangdong province, which were sort of, they look, they are the Saladin glaze, but the clay body is not as fine. Uh, and they're not as high, high well fired, and so uh, when you have soil acidity, they tend to break down uh, quite a lot more than these these two examples. In the 14th century, greenware are uh, the the primary ceramics that are exported by the Southeast Chinese kilns, uh, and this is actually the one that we we get the most uh, in sites like uh, in Singapore where we've been excavating. Um, as we put the, the quantitative data together, and this is sort of very rudimentary, so I would really actually, uh, I look forward to questions and comments later uh, about how one could look at this data. Um, but the main thing to bear in mind is this number here at the bottom. If you work out the average uh, density of the fine ceramics, uh, what, what is apparent is that one site out of these four examples that we have here, uh, Fort Canning Hill, actually has double, if not more than double uh, on average uh, in terms of the finds that are recovered that are fine ceramics compared to these other sites like STA, for example, or EMP or OPH. The implications are important uh, in that FTC is located on a hill, whereas these other sites are located both either on the riverbank or in what we call the plain area, so basically at the foot of the hill in this settlement area. And so initially, obviously, it suggests that sites that are located on the hill appear to consume fine ceramics at a much higher rate than um, sites that are located below the hill, right? Uh, and so some suggest um, a notion of um, social hierarchical difference perhaps is based on economic capabilities or purchasing ability. Um, but when you put the 
the data onto sort of bar graphs, uh, one of the things that is really interesting is uh, a passing of a little bit more of differentiation. So this, the, the blue is um, the blue and white, and then the um, orange color is the white wear, and then the, uh, green, the green wear is represented by the gray. Uh, in this one we know, so at FTC you have double of the blue and white compared to all the other sites here. Um, what is interesting is that in terms of proportion of the amount of white wear, these three sites, STA, FTC, and OPH, appear to sort of maintain more or less the same amount of demand. But when you look at the kinds of fine ceramics that, that the EMP site uh, demands, it is diametrically different from these other sites. And so when we put it on a map, uh, what it seems to suggest is that at least in terms of aesthetic taste, and not, not so much in terms of purchasing power, and so therefore in terms of the economic hierarchy, but just in terms of aesthetic appreciation and demand for uh, fine ceramics that are imported from China, these three sites appear to share commonalities uh, in terms of their taste, whereas this particular site was, in, was just basically different from the other three. Um, what is interesting for us, obviously, is that we've always assumed that sites along the river bank here, because they are located very close to each other physically, would share similar characteristics. But what is what may be revealed in terms of the fine ceramics quantitative data is that the groups that are located over here in the upper parts of the river bank, over here in the plain area, and then up in the hill may in fact share similar sort of social outlook or even what we would call um, it, not so much ethnicity, but just in terms of, you know, taste and, 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 and aesthetic, you know, perceive. Um, a second class of um, ceramics that we can use uh, to sort of work out differentiations in, um, quant in, in terms of um, behavioral patterns and uh, activities would be uh, the coarse ceramics. Uh, that have been excavated in Singapore. And by course, it, it, as opposed to fine ceramics, the critical difference is that fine ceramics are what we call end products. So a, Chinese, a bowl, for example, that is decorated either with a salad or glaze is utilized primarily as a bowl and it's acquired for the purpose of its visual, tactile, and, you know, and, and, and sort of you know, your, you, the sensorial characteristics that it can basically uh, offer. Uh, coarse ceramics are a little different because they tend in general to be produced of clay that are not well refined. But the purpose of it obviously is not the object itself, uh, but its util utilitarian purpose. Um, and so as an example, what is known as mercury jars is a misnomer. Uh, there really isn't any mercury in this thing. Um, but what, what this is, is a, it's the equivalent of a, a bottle. So it's roughly about 28 30 centimeters high. Uh, all of them pretty much look the same. Uh, the form is about the same. If you sort of work, uh, pour a liquid into a complete form and you pour it out and you measure it, it has the same carrying capacity. Uh, and they, they produce like thousands upon thousands of these, uh, primarily in southern Fujian in the provincial kilns in that area. Um, they are very, very highly vitrified, which means that they are impervious to any kind of liquid. So it's used primarily for the carrying of liquids, including things like wine, for example, or perhaps sauce, and so on and so forth. So that's one type of ceramics that is very well, it is very, you know, you find it all the time in island Southeast Asia in the pre-modern era, particularly before the 15th century um, AD. Any sites that, that are dated before the 15th century AD, you would find quite a lot of those um, jar shirts. The second type, uh, uh, these brittle jars, uh, which are interesting. They are very, very roughly made. Um, their tensile strength in terms of the clay body is very low. In other words, they are quite weak. Um, they are also extremely large. So most of them are about this big. If, if, if you reconstruct pieces together, the jars are about this big. So they're quite huge. But the clay body is very thin. So they're thinly potted, extremely large, and fairly fragile. 
So as storage jars, there, there is a, you can only put certain kinds of things in them, right? So things that have low density, for example. So dried food stuff is a, is, is a good example of the kind of um, items that you would probably have used these jars for. Um, and so the, the evidence that comes from the presence of the jars suggests that we're looking at items that have very low density, including dried food stuff, for example, from China, uh, maybe dried spices, uh, so items that are used primarily in the preparation, for example, culinary uh, products. Uh, uh, this is just a close-up, but it gives you this, uh, just a sense of how, um, in terms of the clay structure, it's really very weak. Um, and the third type being these, what we call buff ceramics in, in, in Southeast Asian arch archaeological sort of, you know, parlance. Um, these are quite well refined. Uh, they are very heavily potted and they have fairly high tensile strength. And so they, they in general, are not very large. The full jars are about only this, this big. They're quite squat. Um, but jars are not the only things that, uh, that are made from this kind of clay uh, in the province of, uh, of Guangdong along the coastline. You also have um, this sort of clay and the kilns producing basins and mortars. And so it's not just for the storage of um, high-density items, uh, sometimes including ceramics, but also uh, wet foodstuffs, including things like fermented foods, for example, uh, pickled vegetables. But you also have this material being used to produce things like basins uh, and the uh, mortar where you would prepare food. Um, so the ceramics of this type basically represent um, a, a culinary preparation of value-added process uh, as opposed to the other two types that we're looking at. Um, just a snuck this picture in because everybody loves the Belitong wreck. Um, and so that's a Guangdong jar from the 9th century by carrying, you know, lead ingot. So it's, it's really sort of strong. Uh, and the kind of materials that would be found in these jars are, you know, sort of very, very heavy. So as we put the, you know, the, the, the uh, samples of the quantitative data together, this is what we Fine. Uh, and interestingly, um, the FTC site has a significantly lower average density of coarse ceramic finds than you would in the other sites uh, located in uh, downtown Singapore. Uh, one of that, what it obviously kind of might suggest is that the inhabitants of that particular area of the settlement uh, were either um, there weren't that as many of them, so the density of the population could be actually like half, uh, possibly. If not, then they were not primarily engaged in these activities, and instead, groups that were located in other parts of the settlement were the ones that primary, took the primary ownership of activities in terms of culinary uh, activities and uh, value-added processes in terms of food production and so on and so forth. Um, if we put it onto a graph, uh, like a, a, a graph, uh, a couple of interesting things occur. Uh, one, uh, it does appear that um, the inhabitants in the fort in the FTC site uh, were primarily interested in the usage of liquids um, represented by these mercury jars. If we think of it as wine, then perhaps we are looking at the use of liquids for certain kinds of ceremony purposes that may have occurred up on the hill much more than it did in the other parts of the settlement. Uh, or if we would just assume that they were liquid ingredients, for example, for food, then in terms of the food production process, that usually comes in towards the end of a food production process as opposed to right at the beginning, right? But if you look at the brittle ceramics, then um, we are looking at, in general, a relatively low uh, sort of um, level of demand for um, dried foodstuff ingredients in the culinary sort of production process. What is interesting is the, the buff ceramics, and that sort of confirms, I think, some of these ideas that we might get in terms of the activity differences uh, that we see between these three sites, SDA, EMP, OPH, and FTC. So that's a lot of, um, you know, sort of like 
technical data and technical jargon data. What 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 are we sort of looking at? I think what is interesting is the food um, the food related ceramics data could, in principle, allow us to assume that these two sites are fairly well linked in terms of shared characteristics when it comes to culinary activities, uh, along with EMP located here, as opposed to the earlier map where, in terms of aesthetics, these three sites were basically sharing aesthetic outlook, and this was sort of left out on its own. Um, I don't know how how one can actually sort of think about this because uh, and that would this is where I would really appreciate some help because um, as I look at these 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 gra these bar graphs um, one could assume that the these three are linked together because they are at the highest or, or one could assume on the other hand that these three are related together so it's quite difficult to sort of work it out but the bigger historical implications that I like to sort of mention uh, are as follows. We do have some textual information about the settlement in Singapore in the 14th century. And in one of the texts that is from the, um, the Chinese corpus that's dated to 1349, it's a text known as the Tao Yi Zi Liu, which has uh, entries on 99 different ports in Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean. Uh, and it does have a, an entry on this particular settlement itself. Uh, and in that text, it says that um, the land produces relatively little grain uh, and that inhabitants boiled the seawater to produce salt and that they fermented rice to produce an alcohol. Um, what it also indicates that the settlement has a chief and that the hill has terraces on which the inhabitants lived. What is interesting is that if we take all of that in mind, what may be apparent is that the observer was looking at the settlement from the sea and really primarily only looking at these three areas of settlements. So um, in terms of the food production, in terms of the social economic hierarchy, um, this area here and the inhabitants of this particular settlement may not actually have been in the perspective of that, of, of that, of that account. Um, that's actually very different from the indigenous account. So in 1602, there was a text that was written, an oral traditional text that was sort of codified. It's known as the Sujara Melayu or the Malay Annals. Uh, and in that text, it has five chapters in the beginning that talks about this particular settlement as a precursor to all the other kingdoms that occurred in the Malacca Straits region up to the 17th century. Um, if you use that five chapters and you sort of reconstruct the body politic of this particular settlement, this is actually what it looks like. And basically what, what it is is that you have a ruler in the middle uh, who is basically surrounded by, an, by a core group of people um, who are closely tied to him, both in terms of their loyalty as well as their kinship. So this is actually a kinship group. Um, you also have other groups that are outside of this kinship group that are linked to the polity and linked directly in terms of their patron-client relationship with the ruler, but they do not form part of that sort of kinship group that is the core of this body politic. And so far, we've really only been able to sort of reconstruct this, uh, you know, uh, layout, as it were, of this, um, of this body politic through that text. But what it does suggest is that we may, in fact, be able to use archaeological data to sort of try to work out which groups um, were represented in it, and also to actually test the historical efficacy of this particular text. So that's sort of where um, this project um, is at this juncture. Uh, we are actually working on acquiring a bit more quantitative data, both in Singapore as well as in a number of other sites outside of Singapore, so that we can actually do uh, cross-references uh, for uh, for the reconstruction of settlement patterns. 
So, um, as a conclusion, uh, the main the main thing that I'm trying to sort of put out here is that um, we usually use archaeological data to reconstruct economic stratification. Um, the excess or you know, in, in order to assess international uh, products, um, the notion of economic reciprocity comes in, uh, the notion of economic asymmetry and how the different groups have access to international commodities uh, utilized as a translation to what the economic structure might be in these settlements. And uh, what I'm trying to at least do at this very rudimentary presentation is to sort of try to demonstrate as an initial uh, idea that it might be possible to actually use small finds in Southeast Asia on the coast to sort of demonstrate ethnic differentiation, um, demo demographic differentiation, and different subgroups based on demand nuances uh, that might be evident in the small finds. All right, thank you. Final speaker for this morning's panel is Dr. Hyungmi Park. Dr. Park is an associate professor of history at the City University of New York, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and the Graduate Center. She specializes in the history of cross cultural contacts in East Asia, Islamic world, the Mongol Empire, and global intellectual history, focusing on information and knowledge transfers, including geographical knowledge food, and alcohol making. Her book, Mapping the Chinese and Islamic Worlds, Cross-Cultural Exchange in Pre-Modern Asia, explores contact and exchange between the Islamic world and China by using geographical uh, uh, information. Her new research project looks at world mapping and other types of information transfer in Afro-Euro-Asia and the Atlantic world. Her presentation is entitled Theorizing Maritime Space Through Pre-Modern Sino-Islamic Connections. Dr. Pat, thank you. Good morning. Let me first express my deepest thanks to all of the conference organizers for inviting me to the stimulating conference. So, so as Jack introduced, my book, Mapping the Chinese and the Islamic World, um, is based on my PhD work, and it documents the influence of cross-cultural exchange on the development of geographic knowledge in Chinese and Islamic societies between around like 700 and 1500. So this work focuses on literature and math central to understanding how the society's knowledge about each other increased as the contact grew. In this book, I try to focus on the maritime contact. The first reason for the book's focus on the maritime contact is, was that uh, I had to narrow down the scale because the topic was already too big. Of course, as I was working on the topic, I realized that it's difficult to separate the maritime contact completely from the overland contact. However, I found out that the maritime routes were indeed very important in the medieval contact and ex exchange between the Islamic world and China. So that, uh, but that has received less attention than that of the famous overland Silk Road, labeled by the German geographer Ferdinand von Richthofen. So this, uh, this is what I wrote in my book here. Uh, so this study focuses primarily on maritime contacts in order to consider uh, contrast it with the more familiar narratives about China's contact with the Western regions through the famous overland Silk Road. By 1500s, when the Europeans were initiating active contact with Asian markets, political fragmentations of the Islamic world was disrupting overland trade. At the same time, maritime trade operated continuously, even in the face of strife. And so, Europeans in the 15, 1500s traveled to Asia along the maritime routes, including those between Iraq and China that our Persian Muslims and Chinese had pioneered in earlier times. So in fact, there are more things that I can uh, talk about to document the importance of the maritime contact for this topic. 
Many Arabic and Persian sources primarily give many details about the routes and trade goods for the maritime context. Since I finished my first book manuscript, I have broadened my, the, the focus of my prior research in terms of space, time, and methodology in order to explore the significance of pre-modern geographical knowledge transfers for the rest of the global history. So, so I was very glad because the conference hopes to hope that the result of the conference would make a theoretical contribution to the field, and it's great timing for me to rethink questions of specialty uh, based on my earlier studies and new research. So in my first book, I had to focus on the most important sources and details for the book's overall narrative. In this paper for the conference volume, I hope to incorporate more sources and specific details that show how the major spatial configuration of maritime trade established at the beginning of the Sino-Muslim context continued or changed um, and changed in the following periods, and how some new breakthroughs in maritime spatial understanding, along with some major changes in the maritime contact, influenced people's understanding of the wider world over time. So as earlier excellent talks demonstrated, the maritime space in Afro-Eurasia has connected societies since ancient times. Its seas were open to many peoples who were willing to travel great distances in search of new co uh, contacts and trade, and who developed the ship shipbuilding and navigational technologies that enabled them to undertake such adventures. Um, but it was only after around 700 that many uh, documentary and archaeological sources proved that an entire transoceanic route from one end of the Indian Ocean to the other uh, became the longest and most heavily traveled sea route in regular use before 1492. So, um, so we can talk, consider several features specific to maritime contacts, such as shipbuilding. Um, oh, sorry, shipbuilding uh, and navigational technology expand the scale and trade, less bound to territorial boundaries, continuity, geographic and cartographic knowledge of the world, and expand the world views. So let me present some major findings and thoughts I have collected for today based on previous and recent research, and I would love to discuss them with you and look forward to receiving your feedback. So I wrote my uh, the temporary title, uh, Theorizing Maritime Space Through Pre-Modern Sino-Islamic Connections. In this paper, I would like to explore how people at the time came to understand the maritime space as the maritime contact grew, and how the newly acquired understanding and knowledge influenced their cultural and geographic understanding of the wider world uh, reached through the maritime contact. So one question the conference suggested that we consider is the transformations of cultural and material artifacts that maritime exchanges have, have led to. I would like to pay attention to a change in people's geographic knowledge and worldviews as a transformation of cultural thing that maritime exchanges have led to. The peoples in the two worlds came to theorize maritime space as they developed the medieval maritime context. The paper will analyze each case one by one, uh, the case of uh, the Islamic Middle East and then the case of China. So for example, those in the Islamic world expanded their geographic knowledge of the known world by expanding the maritime space, reaching the Sea of China, the easternmost uh, sea of the seven seas that they uh, theorized. And for the case of the Chinese, they also made their understanding of the sea space more concretely as they began to participate in the maritime trade actively, probably more from like Saojun, the year Saojun. Um, so there have been many individual analyses on each map and geographic account, but uh, there, were, uh, there have been not sufficient researches that explore uh, how people have historically expanded their geographic knowledge and mapped territories by growing contact over time. And, okay. so, um, and, uh, so in the paper's conclusion, 
I would like to provide you some ideas for you through the theoretical base. How can we understand cross-cultural encounters in Indian Ocean littoral by looking at the case of pre-modern Sino-Islamic connections? So uh, I hope this direction makes sense. So firstly, let me show you how the people in the pre-modern Islamic and Chinese worlds uh, came to understand the maritime space as the maritime context grew and what changes they uh, what changes the expanded knowledge brought to the two societies. So, um, so it's the Muslim society that began to theorize the maritime space in the Indian Ocean in the full scale. The growth of maritime travel and trade played an important role in the growth of knowledge about China. Seaborne trade already enjoyed flourishing growth by the middle of the 8th century as Caliph al-Mansur, the second uh, second leader of the Abbasid dynasty made it clear that uh, he boasted that um, uh, there was no obstacle between Baghdad, the capital of uh, the Abbasid Empire, and China. So, and everything is coming from China to, to Baghdad. That's what he boasted. Although located at the eastern edge of the known world, China now existed as a very real place where people traveled regularly to trade. Many archaeological and documentary sources testify to the boom of uh, long-distance trade connecting Middle uh, West Asia to China. And it is also reflected in folkloristic texts such as the Book of the Wonders of India or the famous Sinbad story from One Thousand and uh, One Night. Um, and, um, And um, the spatial understanding of these geographers uh, uh, actually uh, were, uh, were influenced by the ancient the Greeks and Roman uh, heritage. So uh, actually the, the Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, geographers uh, and scholars who uh, began to understand the geography of, geography of the world uh, in the most advanced way because they had several advantages as they expanded their territory. They, they took a lot of sources from uh, the Sasanian Persia that they conquered and the Byzantine Empire. They took a lot of geo uh, scientific text from the, uh, the ancient, uh, from, uh, scientific text that the ancient Greek and Romans um, uh, left, uh, which were not transmitted to Europe after the Western Roman Empire collapsed. But they were transmitted to the Islamic world, and, um, and uh, it was the ancient Greek and Roman geographers who, were, um, who calculated the, the size of the earth and also invented this uh, uh, longitude and latitudinal coordinate systems. And, uh, but for, main, uh, for earlier geographers, uh, so the eastern end of their world was India. At the beginning, as was the ferry plus, they, talk, they, they show the route to India. But they talk about, of course, the mer uh, merchandise from China, but it does, the route does not continue uh, towards the east. And this is from Strabo, and, but the Roman geographers increased their knowledge um, as the contact increased. And the Ptolemy of Alexandria, and now I'm talking about this map, uh, sorry. Uh, so Ptolemy of Alexandria in second century CE, he collected more sources uh, uh, from, uh, that were gained from merchants uh, who travel, uh, who sailed to the east. And, uh, he was able to put more details in the East uh, after, um, further, uh, 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 further, uh, for the East, uh, and then he put like China or Serica and Serica that, uh, that, of course, there are debates, but people say it's like uh, uh, Central Asia and then Northwestern part of China. And uh, so, they clearly say that that's the place where the silk was coming. And, uh, but Ptolemy didn't know, uh, was not sure about uh, uh, the 
eastern end of the Indian Ocean, and he put a label like terra incognita, so unknown world, unknown la land. And uh, this is a reconstructed map based on his uh, data uh, in his book. And uh, as you see, the Indian Ocean is closed. And the, the Muslim uh, geographers uh, was especially influenced by Ptolemy's work. This was the most important uh, text, and they just cite his authoritative work. But they, they knew better about the East, because they also received a lot of uh, information from uh, the Persians, which uh, the Persians also converted to Islam. And, uh, and actually, the earlier uh, scholars who wrote many uh, geographic works uh, were like Persian ori origins. So, um, and so, it's, uh, Al Khwarizmi, he's also from uh, you know Persia. He's a scholar who worked with Caliph Al Mamun, who is uh, who get, uh, who um, worked with uh, scholars on this ancient Greek and Roman and. Um, text, also, also uh, text from the East, like Persian and Indian text, and they translate them into Arabic, the lingua, lingua franca at the time. And uh, then the, they also drew the world map, um, but unfortunately that is not ex extant. But uh, soon after that, the, the, uh, the first, mm, we began to have uh, the earliest world, extant world maps by uh, geographic school, Balki school. Uh, this is one by Al uh, Istakri and, uh, and some earlier ones. And so th this is the earliest map. And the, the Balki school, they actually focus more on the Islamic world, but, uh, but they also uh, drew the world, world maps like this. And can you recognize this? <laughs> so actually, I put uh, it upside down. So uh, the north, they actually put south on the top. Uh, that's their perspective, and there are, of course, there are different reasons, and, and I actually put it upside down so you can understand, and this is the Arabian Peninsula, and you can compare this, it's quite similar in the Indian Ocean, and, uh, and this is a very simplified one, but they had better knowledge, but what I want to say is that this, this kind of world maps was very popular, and uh, and also they wrote a lot of uh, treaties, and I compare the maps with the treaties, and uh, according to these early uh, Abbasid scholars, uh, they, didn't, they, they, they knew better about the Indian Ocean, so all the, uh, uh, the Indian Ocean goes, uh, goes up to China, as seen, uh, and then uh, actually the, this encircling ocean, and the Indian Ocean is connected to the sea, so it's not closed. And uh, yeah, and, and then uh, there are several things we can uh, discuss uh, how they theorize the sea. So the seven, the famous seven seas, and uh, and the Sea of China. Uh, so. We, there are a lot of uh, episodes from folkloristic materials, but. Ibn Khurad uh, is, uh, is, uh, is the pioneer of this uh, book of roots and rams, and, uh, and there are another very important account, uh, earliest account, accounts of China and India, and these two texts will be copied later again and again. Of course, there will be new documents, but they clearly show root from, uh, from the Abbasid uh, Empire, uh, through the southeast and uh, south and south India, all the way to China, and uh, and the rules in general uh, they are uh, they are similar and uh, and um, okay. and uh, and one scholar uh, um, ge geographer, very famous geographer and scholar Al Masoudi, uh, he. He is a geographer, so uh, just what I want to say is uh, Alfred Dadvi, he is a scholar and geographer and official, and uh, the book Accounts of China and India is um, Trevor kind of, uh, it's, it's not Trevor, but uh, it's uh, written by Robert Merchants, and, uh, and, and we, we don't know the author, 
And, uh, and then these professional geographers received information from the merchants. And actually, uh, this account was taken by uh, Abu Zaid, who made it as uh, the volume one, and then he also wrote uh, one volume two in the 10th century. And he clearly mentions we have not very many, but we have some documents that uh, really uh, support all these uh, things. And he clearly says that uh, he exchanged his uh, notes uh, that he received from merchants from uh, from China, uh, merchants from uh, the sea. Uh, in Siraf, the famous seaport, with Al Masaudi. So a chunk of documents overlap in the, uh, the previous account and the Al Masaudi. And Al Masaudi is also interesting. He also received a lot of Greek um, theories about the sea. And, um, but he expanded that more. And in the Indian Ocean, he, he, uh, he, he named all the seas. And I'm sorry, there are some mistakes <laughs> done by the. Uh, the cartographer, um, I, I was not able to check, but it should, the, the six, fifth and sixth seas should be further down. But anyway, the, the thing is, uh, so they, they had these names and uh, this text to in, in, introduce, like what, uh, how to get there and what kind of goods and native goods and trade goods you can get there. And then always they go to all the way to the Sea of China. And uh, so, so this one is uh, I stuck this map, and uh, I actually put uh, the west as, as north because uh, this is the text uh, and, and to compare this, yeah. And uh, so this is made uh, written uh, is a sketch by Al Mukadashi, another uh, Valky school a geographer, and uh, so. Uh, so, and he clearly uh, explains, like, well, he heard about the Indian Ocean from merchants and sailors, and they all say differently. So it's really difficult to understand the real shape. But in general, they theorize this. So uh, they don't know exact shapes, but uh, it starts from the Arabian Peninsula and all the way to India, and then, then uh, oh, oh, sorry. and then, uh, sea of China, Bakra Sin, and then there is China, Tibet, and India. And then uh, in uh, 12th century, uh, this great world map uh, was made by Ali Idrisi, uh, who synthesized all the materials, uh, and, uh, and then uh, he received a lot of inf influence from Ptolemy, the ancient Greek, uh, Greek work, but uh, he also included the uh, the, the Persian and then later the Muslim knowledge expanded through this contact. And uh, then also the, the Malay Peninsula, uh, yeah, we can see. And, uh, and then, so, so the Muslims, they theorized the sea quite early, and, uh, but they also, uh, you, uh, they needed some um, special uh, understanding uh, for practical uh, sh navigation and shipping. And uh, from, from like 9th and 10th century, uh, sources say that uh, because there was a big massacre in 899 in Guangzhou, the Muslims uh, stopped going all the way to China. Instead, they met with the Chinese who were like Southeast Asian merchants in somewhere in Southeast Asia. And then, uh, and from that time on also, also, the Chinese were very active, and then uh, they began to build the junks and also the um, the compass, uh, and then uh, so so they they utilized all this uh, improved navigational technology and they began to come to Indian Ocean. But they were very active in the Eastern Indian Ocean, and then uh, the Daos went all the way to uh, uh, to India or Southeast Asia, and then uh, later. Uh, Geographers like uh, even Fra I'm sorry, even Batuta also talks about that, and uh, so and I also so first I started working on the text, but later I also tried to do some you know field works, and uh, I realized that actually it makes sense that they change many ships on the way, and then but of course there are uh, like 
uh, of course, some ships can go all the way, but uh, they, um, but more ship, Chinese ships in the Eastern Indian Ocean, and then and uh, it would be much easier for them to just transfer. So. Um, so I didn't make uh, the map for the, uh, that kind of division, but it's just, this is the 13th, 14th century uh, map, and the more contacts between uh, the West and China, and uh, so, so uh, also many, um, many uh, Western sources like uh, even Batuta, and Marco Polo, Odoric, they all talk about a huge, like several hundreds of junks, and they they were so impressed. They, they have never seen such uh, many junks. So okay, so let me. Oh, I'm sorry. I let, let me go very briefly with the case of China. Uh, and uh, so, in very ancient, sea was very important, but they didn't really explore the sea from the very ancient period. And uh, um, and then uh, through the through the Silk Road uh, explored by Zhang Qian in the ancient period, uh, they they brought information about the Western countries. Also, they talk about the Xihai, but it was very vague. But after the Tang Dynasty, oh yeah, so the Zhang Qian, uh, the West to Central Asia. The, this is the first to you know Silk Road. They talk about Xihai, the Western Sea, but somewhere in the West, but. It was not very concrete, and it's after the Tang Dynasty that uh, the more documents uh, give uh, specific information about Indian Ocean, especially the Jadan's famous route to foreign countries across the sea from Guangzhou. Uh, so, where well, this is the map I sketched and then the cartographer uh, drew, and so the Jadan's route overlaps with uh, that of even Khradadvik, and then also the Book of China and India, and they uh, actually Jadan's uh, account is earlier than that because the Arabic developed later than the Chinese. But the sources were clearly from the Islamic world because uh, this is a diagram, and I con reconstructed based on the texture uh, uh, calculation and how many days. Like, and I, I did I used a very primitive uh, way at the time, and and but. It's, it makes quite sense compared to the actual, uh, you know, the ma uh, actual geography. Uh, the route from Canton uh, uh, goes all the way through Southeast and South Asia to Baghdad, and uh, and then another route is going down to uh, eastern coast of Africa. So um, and yeah. And then, uh, and then center is Baghdad. It's not China. But the Song Dynasty, the Chinese uh, were more involved, and um, and uh, actually they, as I told you, I, they began to make more junks, and and they also divide all the seas, uh, and they began to theorize the Great Eastern Eastern Ocean Sea, and. Uh, the Sea of Ceylon, and here in the Western Indian Ocean, they named uh, this uh, Eastern Sea of the Muslims, and the Western Sea of the Muslims. So uh, for, uh, at the time, uh, the Islam word, Dashi, uh, that's what they called, is, it was very important, and uh, the sea is uh, really uh, getting um, more and more familiarized. And the song, it, but so these were like uh, their kind of texture uh, imagination. And in the map, they, they do only China, and then they listed like the names of the countries. They were less interested in making a map but uh, the foreign countries. But uh, one like, Buddhist map shows that um, uh, in, um, in, in uh, 20, uh, seven, uh, 1270s, uh, so he used like earlier sources and to to put China in the east, and it's a Buddhist uh, map. So China is not at the center, and then, but he also combined like earlier ancient knowledge with uh, the more contemporary uh, information uh, to understand the whole world. And, um, and then you, we can see Xihai clearly in the east, you know, in the east, uh, western, uh, western part of the sea. Uh, Xihai oh, oh, it's here. Yeah. 
oh, the CI is here, and uh, so and also and many uh, specific countries uh, from Southeast Asia and also West Asia, Baghdad, uh, so they were located not very precisely, but uh, they located them in the sea. So mm, they uh, and then the biggest breakthrough came in the Mongol Empire, especially Kublai Khan. He boasted like they had now empire from the sun, sun rise to sunset, and they brought a lot of uh, maps from the Islamic world, and then uh, also like sea route, and then so they combined these things to make uh, world maps. And this is not from the uh, it, it was made by using the Mongol period uh, Chinese maps, and because the the author of the Korean map claimed that. Uh, and uh, in the Africa, it's just a little more, yeah, in the Europe, and uh, so, so it's the Southeast Asia and then India is not very clear because they actually combined like different you know, mapping traditions, but they were, they were connected. And uh, also, Hormuz in Persian Gulf. So, and then how many days it takes, uh, it talks, uh, and uh, also in the, from the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol period, they began to divide uh, the Dongyang and Xiang, Eastern, Eastern Ocean and Western Ocean. So instead of uh, high, uh, the, another capital for China, they began to use this term, like big oceans. So they probably began to expand their uh, spatial uh, understanding. And, and the, so Eastern Indian Ocean and Western Indian Ocean and, uh, and the one of the, the cantons, um, because the tier talk about uh, the many co foreign countries, the number of the foreign countries uh, increased, uh, like more than double, and then, and then uh, like it divide like uh, how many, what countries are from, uh, from the uh, Western India, West, small Western India Ocean and the big Western India, so it, it divides the sea like that. And then uh, in the Ming Dynasty had a big blow uh, uh, at the beginning because of the sea band policy. But uh, soon um, uh, there was another. Uh, uh, there was the biggest uh, maritime exploration led by Zheng He during the Emperor Yongluo period. And its, it's title is the uh, the uh, Xia Xiang uh, descent to the Western Ocean. In its, uh, so the seventh one is going all the way to uh, Hormuz and Mecca and the East African coast. Uh, and it's based on, uh, the scale is big, but the, uh, it's based on earlier um, uh, uh, you know, legacy of the uh, uh, sailing trade. And then, yeah, this is, uh, I, I put each map of Zhenghe uh, uh, together to make it as a route. And, so this map is, doesn't show the world, but we can, uh, it's more for like a navigation route, and there are really uh, great details for each navigation uh, techniques and uh, methods. And the final destination is Hormuz. And uh, so, we are, uh, so there are more <laughs> um, uh, evidence uh, like we can um, use to discuss this, uh, but just a few uh, theoret a few ideas to, uh, to think about like some theoretical base to fr frame the topic's overall narrative based on the analysis. So how can we understand cross-cultural encounters in the Indian Ocean literal by looking at the case of pre-modern Sino-Islamic uh, connections? And, and what is the sig significance of cultural and geographical knowledge of the world extended through exchanges between the Chinese and Islamic worlds to the cross-cultural encounters in the Indian Ocean literal in global history. So, uh, so where the, there are a lot of borrowings of the information. So uh, the Greeks, uh, the, the Muslim, they borrowed information from the Greeks and the Persians and that also through the Chinese connections and the Chinese also they, they borrowed and um, information from the West and then based on the knowledge they explored more. Uh, and then uh, one interesting thing I found is uh, in the Indian Ocean, you know, in our uh, uh, understanding, it doesn't go all the way to South China Sea. So it's bad for the Muslims and the Chinese. 
the, the China and the, the, uh, the Middle East were connected in the African coast. So they were like, yeah, the one sea is not divided much. But of course, they, are, they theorized like several divisions they, they needed. And, uh, and then, uh, and, uh, so uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Salon showed uh, the sea monsters. And we can find many in the European maps, but it's difficult to find pick, uh, sea monsters in Islamic and Chinese maps. And is it because sea was more like a real and familiar place? Or probably there can be more reasons, but I, I just say uh, it's very interesting difference and contrast. Uh, and then I have to elaborate more, but the Chinese, uh, for them, uh, the, they were quite open. So they, at the beginning, they didn't go out, but they welcomed the people, uh, of course, who come with, uh, for tribute. And gradually, they expanded their scale. Uh, and then they also built the uh, navy from the Song Dynasty. And yeah, but still, um, they were less, more relaxed about the sea. Uh, and uh, they didn't really declare the border, and so uh, that uh, kind of like how they uh, understood the, their own territory and the other territory, the wider world, it, it would be interesting thing to discuss. And that's a bird, bird eyes view on the overall change uh, de detected by this comparative approach allows us to evaluate the contribution and historical significance of medieval Sino-Muslim uh, contact and the society's geographic understanding of the Indian Ocean in the pre-modern period and conclude that it helped to lay the foundations of the age of uh, globalization uh, because actually that knowledge was not just uh, shared by, uh, shared in the Indian Ocean, that would go to move to other places and uh, especially to Europe and uh, from the Mongol period, many uh, just a few, the, uh, um, more like, the Marco, like Marco Polo and Odorig and, and many, uh, not very many, but quite, quite um, some like people, you know, from uh, the Italian, um, uh, the Italy, and they, they, they came to uh, China during the Mongol period and through the sea. So they brought th this information and, and then, uh, then gradually they, uh, the Europe, that was isolated in the medieval, it's not isolated, but it's, they were not less interested in the wider world during, uh, during the medieval period. They, uh, they were exposed to this extended knowledge and uh, this is a map uh, written around like 1300, Marco Polo area, uh, the period. And uh, this is very different from the typical uh, medieval European map is um, TO map. Uh, they put Jerusalem at the center, and in uh, in the in the far east there is a paradise instead of China. And uh, but here, uh, this is not just one of them, but there are more coming. Uh, but they, they gradually began to put China in the map, and then of course in the text, and then. Yeah, it's difficult to uh, deny that this geographic information uh, stimulated the Europeans. And we are, uh, let me stop here. And uh, I would really love to uh, discuss more like uh, ideas with you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.